This lecture covers the topic, Jefferson in Power, and the focus question is, what were the achievements and failures of Jefferson's presidency? At Jefferson's inauguration in March 1801, he tried to conciliate his Federalist opponents by claiming that both parties shared the same principles even if they disagreed in their opinions. Jefferson vowed to reduce government, free trade, ensure freedom of religion and the press, and avoid entangling alliances with other nations. He sought to dismantle much of the Federalist edifice and prevent the kind of centralized state Federalists promoted. He pardoned those jailed under the Sedition Act, reduced the army and navy and the number of government employees, abolished all taxes except for the tariff, and paid off part of the nation's debt. As Hamilton had predicted, it proved impossible for Jefferson to uproot national authority entirely. Jefferson distrusted the unelected judiciary, but it was headed by John Marshall, an Adams appointee who was a strong believer in national supremacy. In 1803, the Marshall Court decided the case of Marbury v. Madison. Just before leaving office, Adams appointed multiple justices of the peace in the District of Columbia, but Madison refused to commission them for their offices. Four of the appointees, one of them William Marbury, sued for their positions. Marshall declared the section of the Judiciary Act of 1789 permitting courts to order executive officials to deliver commissions unconstitutional and void because it exceeded the constitutional power of Congress. According to Marshall, even though Marbury was entitled to his commission, the Supreme Court could not force its delivery by the current administration. While Jefferson got his way with the decision, he saw it as a high-cost victory because Marshall had established the precedent of judicial review, meaning the Supreme Court had assumed the right to determine the constitutionality of Congress's action. Seven years later, the case Fletcher v. Peck extended Supreme Court judicial review to state laws. When a corrupt land bargain was rescinded by a subsequent legislature, Marshall declared that a contract could be broken by a state regardless of the circumstances of the initial legislature's actions. Jefferson saw the Louisiana Purchase as his greatest achievement, and yet his view was highly ironic given its origins and character. Acquired by France in 1800, the vast Louisiana territory stretching from the Mississippi to the Rocky Mountains was purchased by Jefferson for the very small sum of $15 million. But it was sold only because the Haitian Revolution, which Jefferson detested, had defeated an overtaxed French military and Napoleon needed funds for campaigns in Europe. Americans were happy to secure the port of New Orleans, thus ensuring a previously precarious right to freely trade on the Mississippi. Though Jefferson doubled the nation's size and ended France's presence in North America, the Federalists opposed the purchase as wasteful. Jefferson believed Louisiana ensured the survival of the agrarian republic of small and independent virtuous farmers. A strict constructionist, he also acknowledged that the Constitution nowhere gave the President the right to take this kind of action without approval from Congress. Nonetheless, he felt the benefits justified his transgression. Soon after purchasing Louisiana, Jefferson dispatched two fellow Virginians, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, to explore it. They were to conduct scientific and commercial surveys in order to find ways to exploit the region's resources, develop trade with Indians, and find a commercial route to the Pacific Ocean that could foster trade with Asia. In two years, and guided for a large segment of the journey by Sacagawea, a 15-year-old Shoshone Indian woman, Lewis and Clark traveled all the way to the Pacific, reaching it in the area of today's Oregon, and back. Though they did not find a commercial route to Asia, their success reinforced the belief that America's territory would one day extend to the Pacific Ocean. In 1803, New Orleans was the only part of the Louisiana Purchase with a significant non-Indian population. Over half of 8,000 residents were slaves and free blacks. Incorporating the diverse population into the United States was no easy task. French and Spanish law accorded free blacks nearly all the rights of white citizens, slaves were entitled to certain legal protections, and freedom through purchase or voluntary emancipation was much easier than in the United States. The treaty that transferred Louisiana to the United States promised that all free inhabitants would enjoy the rights of citizens. While Louisiana retained the Spanish and French civil codes outlining the principles of community property within a marriage, women's co-ownership, Free blacks' rights steadily declined. The local legislature adopted one of the most sweeping slave codes in the South, forbidding any consideration of freedom and severely limiting avenues for manumission. For slaves in Louisiana, the tyranny of Spain was far freer than the liberty of the United States. 
The Louisiana Purchase showed that, despite being far removed from Europe, the United States was deeply affected by events across the Atlantic. Because the United States depended on many goods, especially manufactured goods from Europe, the wars there directly influenced Americans' livelihoods. Jefferson hoped to avoid becoming entangled in Europe's wars, but ultimately he could not ignore these struggles. Jefferson, who wanted a diminished central state, used the military to fight the nation's first war, a war to protect commerce in the Mediterranean. In North Africa, the Barbary states had long preyed on European and U.S. shipping, although they refrained from attacking ships if a nation paid a hefty tribute. When Jefferson refused demands that the United States increase its tribute, the Pasha of Tripoli, in modern-day Libya, declared war on the United States, a conflict that lasted until 1804. Despite the conflict's resolution, Tripoli continued to harass American shipping until after a show of force during the War of 1812. The Barbary Wars were the new nation's first encounter with the Islamic world. In the 1790s, in an attempt to establish peaceful relations, the federal government declared that the United States was not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion. Nonetheless, the conflicts began a pattern in which Americans viewed Muslims as an exotic people whose ways of life did not adhere to Western standards. For many Americans, Islam rested beside monarchy and aristocracy as old world despotism. When war between France and Britain resumed in 1803, each nation imposed a blockade to deny the others trade with the United States, which was officially neutral. The British also engaged in the impressment of American sailors essentially kidnapping them for service in the Royal Navy. Jefferson, believing America's economy required free trade, persuaded Congress to enact the Embargo Act, which prohibited all American vessels from sailing to foreign ports, to force an end to the blockades. The embargo stopped almost all American exports and devastated the nation's ports, but did not persuade France or Great Britain to end their blockades. In 1809, Jefferson signed the Non-Intercourse Act, which banned trade only with Britain and France and promised a resumption of trade with either nation if it ended its ban on American shipping. In 1808, Jefferson's successor, James Madison, easily won election as president. With the Embargo Act of Failure and deeply unpopular, in 1810 Madison forged a new policy in which trade was resumed with both powers, but it provided that if either France or Britain stopped interfering with American shipping, the United States could reimpose an embargo on the other nation unless that nation too ceased its intervention against U.S. ships. France ended its blockade, and the British increased their attacks on American ships and sailors. In 1812 Madison resumed the embargo against Britain. Young congressmen from the West, known as war hawks, such as Henry Clay of Kentucky and John Calhoun of South Carolina, called for the war, in part because it would be an opportunity to conquer Florida and Canada. Others wanted a war to defend the principles of free trade and end Europe's power over America. <laughs> 